Hello, Pod Fam. Welcome to another episode of The Tea with Laura and Rachel. Today, we have a very special guest. She is an abortion rights activist and the founder and executive director of the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada, Joyce Arthur. Welcome to the show, Joyce. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me on, Laura and Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, we are just so excited to have you here. You know, all the great work that you've been doing. It's going to be a lot of fun to dive deep into a few questions that we didn't get to cover in our first episode talking about abortion in Canada. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an understatement to say that we are honored to have you here. So, Oh, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) I'm just an ordinary person who happened to get into this role. So, (laughs) Well, good thing you did. So before we get into it, what are you drinking today? I have tea and I didn't have time to make iced tea. So it's hot tea on a hot day, but that's fine. It's um, called Honeybush Mandarin and Orange Herbal Tea. Oh, 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 that sounds really really good. That's okay. Well, I'm also having a hot tea and I had to turn off my AC because the fan wouldn't stop blowing. Um, (laughs) But I'm having stress reliever. So we're going to see if this is going to counteract the uh, dying of heat versus, you know, stress relieving tea. Rachel, what are you having? I am having a chamomile tea. It is also a hot tea. And like you, Laura, there was a lot of traffic outside. So I closed my window And I don't have AC in here, so I think it's going to get a little toasty. (laughs) But you guys could see uh, our video. It's going to we're going to start getting awfully glowy (laughs) halfway through this interview. (laughs) But anyway, Joyce, we are so excited to have you here. And we just kind of want to start off, you know, how did you become an abortion rights activist and why did you start the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada? Well, uh, where to start? Uh, I mean, I was never much of a activist or political or anything until in the mid 80s. Well, I was raised in a fundamentalist Christian household. And basically, I kind of rebelled against religion and all that and all the strictures. I was feminist from like the age of 10. And uh, pro-choice is, is from the moment I can remember first thought about it, but everyone around me was was different. <laughs> yeah. um, but I got involved in activism by uh, fighting the teaching of um, uh, creationism in public school science classes. And so, I mean, fundamentally where I'm, I'm sort of coming from is uh, almost like um, uh, anti-religion stance because I see that anti-choice viewpoint is also being kind of based mostly on religion, partisan religious viewpoint. So um, in 88, uh, very early in 88, in fact, um, just a few days after the Morgenthaler decision, I had an abortion myself and it was approved under the old system, the hospital therapeutic abortion committee system. And I mm-hmm. remember just being kind of shocked at the time that, you know, oh, I I don't get to do this myself. Some doctors I don't even know or meet that are going to approve it for me. (laughs) So it was kind of gobsmacking. And uh, luckily I was in Vancouver, so it was done at BGH. So it was, um, they just rubber stamped them. But I learned that was not the case for other women across Canada who were often denied abortion. So that got me interested in the issue. And later that same year in summer of 88, I just stumbled upon a pro-choice rally at the Vancouver Art Gallery where they have lots of activist events. I thought, oh, what's this? And it was a pro-choice rally. So I ended up joining the group, which at the time was the BC Coalition for Abortion Clinics, which founded one of the first clinics in uh, Vancouver. And I just started volunteering and just uh, over the years did more and more. And then kind of the old leadership of the group fell away. And suddenly I was there leading the group. It was never like an intentional thing. I'm not really an ambitious kind of person, (laughs) but um, (laughs) there I was. And um, I started a newsletter. The newsletter became national. Uh, We changed the name of the group to the Pro-Choice Action Network. And uh, we had an NDP government at the time in BC, and there was uh, lots of good things going on. And I was looking national and noticed that there was a lot of work to do nationally on various issues. So I thought, oh, I should take uh, Pro-Choice Action Network national. And uh, that long story short, we uh, ended up starting a whole new group, and that was the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada. And that was in 2005 that we launched. And because uh, the Pro-Choice Action Network was just a provincial group, and they stuck around for a couple more years, but they're closed now. So we, uh, ARC does the BC work as well now. <laughs> Yeah, that's amazing. And definitely with what's going on right now in in Ontario in particular, where we are, you know, we have a conservative government and we're at risk right now of actually losing our public health care. And, you know, this this is definitely going to have a ripple effect. And I think right down to people being able to access abortions as well. That's awful. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's kind of the current landscape. Um, We'll have to see what happens in the in the next little bit under the Ford government. But uh, 
you know, we're just so glad that there are organizations like yours that are actually standing up and really holding the government accountable. Yeah, we thought at the time, like going back to 2005, there was another national group called the Canadian Abortion Rights Action League, which had been around since the 70s. And their their um, their goal was to get rid of the abortion law, which they did. So they uh, closed up shop around the early 2000s. But we felt that there was still room for a national uh, political uh, abortion rights group. And so that's when we formed. And from the beginning, we've done things like fight against anti-choice motions and bills in Parliament and just sort of everything we can to just... Um, be out there and mobilize people and fight back against any incursion of abortion rights. That's amazing. So with ARC, what would you say the vision of the organization is? Well, we basically are uh, here to defend uh, the legal right to abortion and work to improve access. And I think, um, I mean, that's kind of like what our our mission is. But I think underneath that, what's really, really important is to uh, reduce abortion stigma in society mm-hmm. and normalize abortion care as an integral part of reproductive health care and the health care system in general. And uh, so I think, you know, if we ever succeeded in reducing abortion stigma or getting rid of it entirely, we probably wouldn't need, you know, pro-choice groups anymore. It would just be automatically protected and no one would think twice about it and we wouldn't have any opposition. But as long as we mm-hmm. have opposition, we have to keep fighting. So uh, we kind of see ourselves as, you know, we don't have like a, a goal, so to speak, because we know that we're going to be here forever fighting this battle, unfortunately. And we do just a lot of day-to-day work, you know, communications with our members and, and it just, uh, it just goes on. Yeah, no, this is definitely a fight that unfortunately is never going to end because you're always going to have those fringe groups, no matter how, you know, small they are, they, they are quite loud. And could you just kind of take us through a little bit how, ARC would approach the government and, and, you know, is it supporting the Canada Healthcare Act or lobbying groups? You know, how, how do you kind of get at the um, government role? Uh, various ways. I mean, we are at a bit of a disadvantage because I'm in Vancouver and we don't actually yeah. currently have a rep in Ottawa. So we don't have the, the privilege of being able to meet in person with, with MPs, except for you know, the local MPs in this area which we have done. Uh, basically, I'm kind of uh, really a, a computer activist. I work at home and a lot of my work is done by computer and you know, phone, emails. So that's what we spend a lot of time doing is just um, putting things in writing and sending things to MPs. Like we'll send them our position papers or uh, press releases or talking points against bills or whatever issue is coming up in parliament. So we help educate them that way. And there's been many times where, for example, when a bill is being debated in parliament, We'll hear the MP parrot our talking points that we gave them. So that's really nice. So we've built relationships that way, especially with the more stronger pro-choice MPs, which are like largely the NDP party, but some liberal yeah. MPs as well. And um, we're kind of tr- currently trying to work with you know the, the deputy uh, prime minister's office in the finance ministry, Krista Freeland, and also the Canada Revenue Agency, because one of our campaigns is to remove charitable tax status from anti-choice groups. So um, they're going to give us a hearing. So that's great. <laughs> but the other thing we do, I think, in general, is we try and work with other pro-choice groups. So, for example, there's two other national pro-choice groups in Canada called uh, National Abortion Federation of Canada, or NAF Canada, and the Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. And so Action Canada is actually based in Ottawa, and they've got great relationships with MPs and, uh, and uh, ministry offices, et cetera. So uh, we've been, I've been meeting with them, with people at NAF Canada and Action Canada, and we're sort of collaborating on various campaigns and issues and working together and uh, asking for meetings together. And I mean, during the pandemic, everything's on Zoom anyway. So, you know, don't, you don't really yeah. need to be in Ottawa. So it hasn't been a, a really big disadvantage for us, I don't think, over the years. And um, that's basically how we work. And we do things like uh, in campaigns, we have like petitions. We have a petition going right now. Uh, they're going to be submitting to the, the government shortly. And um, this is a, actually it's an online petition, but you can, we can do done parliamentary petitions as well. So, yeah, we just... Uh, stay in touch with uh, the MPs. Like I have a whole email list of all 330 of them <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, and just try and build relationships where we can also hold um, uh, MPs to account. So for example, I uh, recently published an article against uh, Pierre Polyev, the, the conservative party leadership candidate who's going around claiming he's pro-choice and I did some research on him and, um, and realized, Oh, he's actually not pro-choice at all. He's got a long anti-choice perfect record going back <laughs> decades. So, um, so that's something that we do as well and making sure that other MPs know about that. And um, so just equipping them with knowledge and arguments that they can use in Parliament is, is probably one of the key things that we do. 
Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I love that you're kind of just this uh, wealth of knowledge that all of these uh, government officials can go to and actually, you know, get the dirt on on each other, essentially, you know, <laughs> especially <laughs> with uh, with Pierre, you know, he he's a scary guy, in my opinion. Um, I, I really hope that he is not successful with uh, leading the Conservative Party. And actually, I just wanted to ask you about how you kind of break down the bills for the MPs, because I noticed a lot of them, they may have uh, voted in a kind of pro-life situation, but they didn't understand the bill. So you're kind of that liaison to say, you know, hey, we we saw you kind of vote this direction, but, you know, do, do you actually understand what this stands for? That's a really good point. And there was a bill last year, the sex two, collection bill. 223 two, or 233? Two, yes, 223, two, two, I think. Two, two, the three. numbers are confusing. <laughs> And uh, there was also a bill a few years ago that would have um, made it a separate crime to injure or kill a fetus when, uh, during a crime against a pregnant woman, which would have opened the door to fetal personhood. Yeah. And it was mm-hmm. interesting because we we keep a, a list of anti-choice MPs like based on their voting record and public statements and whether they've attended an anti-choice event and things like that. And um, there's only about, at the time, a couple of months ago, there was maybe eight or nine pro-choice conservatives on our list, and all the rest were either anti-choice or had an unknown stance. And uh, someone posted, it was, a, it was a media outlet called The Maple, and they posted on Instagram our list, and it kind of went viral. Mm-hmm. And when, within days, we were contacted by several MPs saying, what am I doing on the anti-choice list? I'm pro-choice. And they wanted me to take off, right? which I think is really great. So I actually had discussions with them and it turned out that some of them had been actually basically misled by that bill, thinking that it had nothing mm. to do with abortion rights. It wasn't, you know, it was just something to help the family or whatever. So they were misled. And uh, I had sent all our talking points to all the MPs at the time, but you know, maybe some of them don't read them. So uh, I agreed to move them to our pro-choice list. They, they gave me evidence that, that they had a pro-choice commitment and I got them to agree that, oh yes, we'll look at your talking points. And so I was able to move some of the anti-choice as well as unknown MPs to our pro-choice list on the conservative side, which I think is great because, you know, if we can get a lot of pro-choice conservatives, that will really dilute the power of the anti-choice MPs in the party. And as you're just saying, we don't want Pierre Polyev as the leader. So maybe everyone should uh, just temporarily join the conservative party and go in there and vote for John Charest. (laughs) There's an idea right there. And actually, yes, just kind of on... um, uh, around the time that uh, Roe v. Wade had been overturned in the U.S., Rachel and I, we had kind of sent letters out to our MPs, and they both are, in fact, conservative. Uh, one was an unknown position, and the other one was a known anti-choice. And I, I know the one instantly who was unknown, he's like, oh, no, like he had a reply back within the hour saying, no, I am pro-choice, and I want to make that stance clear. So that was really great to get that feedback and then the one who had had the, the history of voting anti-choice, it, it took him a week to get mm-hmm. a reply, but he's like, no, no, I am actually, and I think he might've been one of the ones who was misled in previous voting, but you know, he'll be, I think you got to put an asterisk next to those ones, you know, are they actually going to say, or like do what they're going to say, or are yeah. they just kind of trying to save face for the current times? Yeah. And I mean, I'm, I was telling them as well, like, it's not good enough for you just to say, well, we're not going to legislate on abortion. That's the party policy. Like, that's mm-hmm. not enough. I want you to know that they are personally pro-choice and would actually stand up and defend uh, a woman's right to mm-hmm. abortion and do more to have access, not just like do nothing. Yeah. Excellent. You know, they need to be held accountable. Yeah. Actions definitely speak louder than words. Springing off of this Laura had mentioned that um, really when Roe v. Wade, not when it was overturned, but before when we knew that it was a rumor that it was going to be overturned, we both got very involved in our own research of abortion history in Canada and what our rights are. And we noticed that there are there's a lot of push right now about whether or not there needs to be an abortion law. Can you explain to us why we should not enshrine abortion rights into law in Canada? Sure. I mean, that is a challenging question because it se- might seem that that might be the obvious thing to do to protect our rights. But, you know, abortion is a healthcare procedure, among other things, mm-hmm. and no other healthcare procedure has its own law, with the exception of medical assistance in dying. And that's been a bit of a disaster, in my opinion, because uh, the mm-hmm. law that they put in place was a criminal law and it was too restrictive. People's rights were being violated. People had to go to court and 
And so it just gets messy and it's unnecessary. And human rights don't have to be specifically codified in law that way, especially for healthcare. So the fear is, of course, that if you, even if you try to, you know, draft a really great law that, you know, prioritizes women's health and rights and it's, it's the laws about guaranteeing access. You know, the laws, the uh, bills go through a process, right? So they go through, you know, debate and committee and there's amendments and, uh, you know, we've got all the anti-choice MPs, you know, putting in their thing. And so what are you going to end up with? Maybe a, a bill with a bunch of restrictions on it. Or even mm-hmm. if you did end up with it, with a bill, a good bill, a good law, you know, it's still subject to attack. They can uh, re- repeal it later, a conservative government could, or, or amend it, or whatever. And I've always said that we don't want any kind of law that might restrict abortion in some way, because it gives the anti-choice movement a platform to build on, foundation. And we think that with any kind of law, it's almost like handing a gift to the anti-choice movement, suddenly they have a framework that they can, you know, start um, mobilizing upon and passing, you know, amendments or trying to, right? So it's just, a, I think, a dangerous situation. And, you know, also, I, I, I think, like, would a law really make any difference? I mean, we actually have the tools we now, right now that we need to improve abortion access. We can enforce the Canada Health Act better, the Liberal government, uh, work with the provinces more, ensure that they're all you know, delivering uh, reproductive health care in a standardized, equitable manner. So no matter where you live in Canada, you can access uh, abortion care. They can give more funding to the provinces. They can increase the federal health transfer so that provinces have more money to spend on that. They can attach strings. And provinces, of course, can also just themselves provide more funding for uh, reproductive health care, except most of them wouldn't because seven of them have, seven of them have conservative premiers. Uh, but that's where the Liberal government has a really important role to play. And the Canada Health Act is a national law, federal law that governs uh, health care. It, it's not used enough. It's not enforced enough. And, and we can do more to improve that. And uh, so we already have the tools and, and everything we need right now. Like without any law, that, which might end up being restrictive, there is a, a broad right to abortion. There's nothing to restrict the right to abortion in Canada. We have the Charter, which protects abortion under bodily autonomy or integrity, and um, as well as life, liberty, secure, uh, and uh, freedom of conscience. So uh, all these things. Uh, and I also like to point out that because an abortion law would only impact people with uteruses, women and you know, some trans- transgender people, it's automatically discriminatory under gender equality, right? So you can't have any law anyway that would target just abortion. So, uh, and even talking about, like some people have said, well, what about, we need a charter amendment, you know, guaranteeing guaranteeing abortion rights. Well, I think that's just a really um, pie in the sky, like really, really hard to actually get to that point. I mean, if we actually had one, maybe that would be a good thing, but getting there would be, it's unrealistic and we want to spend years and lots of our time trying to shoot for that pie in the sky thing that would have a lot of opposition and, and so on. So I think let's just use the tools we have. We have the right now. Uh, let's just make sure that it's, it's uh, actually implemented and abortion is available across across the country. I just want to mention too that like it was funny because uh, Action Canada or Sexual Health and Rights, together with the National Association of Women in the Law, put together a paper uh, saying explaining why we didn't need a law. And in the meantime, I was writing my own paper on the same topic. <laughs> and I looked at their paper and I was like, "Wow, we're right, we're right aligned with each other. We agree with each other." And, you know, I took a look up a few points from their draft. I think they took a few points from my draft and then we, we published our papers. But um, it was really good to know that we were all on, all on the same page this way, that there's this consensus. And, that, and because the Liberal government was actually tossing around the idea of legislating on abortion. So I think they've kind of put that in the back pocket for now because of our, our interventions. So it's great. Yeah, yeah, it definitely seems like just a, a slippery slope, right? Like it's it's giving them an inch and they would just take a mile. And like you said, you know, sure, it's... It's all great and on our side right now, but the next government that comes in, they could easily turn that around. And uh, something we kind of noticed, uh, again, with the with the Roe v. Wade was a lot of Canadians in general did not understand that abortion is, it's under the Health Care Act, right? Like it's, it's not illegal. We don't even have a law pertaining to it. So that's where I found uh, these anti-choice groups were kind of using that as an opportunity to push their agenda of like, yeah, let's get a law, let's get a law. And um, that's kind of why we really wanted to have episodes and have experts like yourself on here to say, no, this is, this is wrong. You know, we, we already have everything. We just need to improve the access to it. Exactly. And it's, it's always been the anti-choice movement demanding a law. So let's not, uh, you know, not, not take a page from their book. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Got to stay the course. Yeah. You know, I think with Canada, We kind of like to look at ourselves with rose-colored glasses, where 
we're a bit further ahead than the States, for instance. But as we were diving more and more into this, and I actually read quite a few reports, one on your personal website, and then also on ARC's website, about the issue of conscious objection in reproductive health care. Because, you know, growing up as a woman, I always thought, okay, well, this is a medical procedure. All doctors won. I feel like they have been taught how to do it, but they also should be providing it to me if I request it. So can you explain to us what conscious objection is and what impacts being denied treatment can have on someone seeking abortion care? Sure. First of all, the, the, the term is conscientious objection. Conscientious and, uh, objection. Okay. It's a bit hard to say if you're saying it over and over again. So I often shorten it to CO. So I might say CO okay. and that means conscientious objection. But uh, to start with, I mean, okay, what it basically is, is a, a doctor, um, some kind of treatment goes against their personal beliefs and they refuse to provide it and maybe even refuse to refer the patient to uh, another doctor who can provide it. So as you can imagine abortion is like the top <laughs> uh, treatment that follows, uh, that becomes sort of victim to this uh, process of the uh, CO. And, um, mm-hmm. but not just uh, abortion, but also birth control, other reproductive health care, sometimes even vasectomy and um, gender affirming care is, is a big new one that's happens as well. And medical assistance in dying, which, you know, mm-hmm. by the way, they, there's the, the federal law on medical assistance in dying guarantees CO for doctors, which I think is too bad. So our group, ARC, is really against this practice. I mean, if you're going to be a doctor, especially if you're going to be like an obgyne, obstetrician gynecologist, and you're going to this specialty knowing that you're going to encounter you know, many patients with unwanted pregnancy where the, the, the standard of care is an abortion and you can't provide that standard treatment, then why are you even becoming an odd guy? You know, what, what business mm-hmm. do you have getting into that profession? And even a, a GP, uh, uh, which is you know, more wide ranging, but uh, every GP is going to come, come across patients who need birth control pills or whatever. And again, if you're not willing to prescribe that, why are you a GP? Are you not providing this sort of basic level of care for patients? And it's it's almost like I see it as a kind of an arrogance of doctors in the profession. Like it goes back to the days when it's like doctor knows best and uh, the, the doctor authority over the patient. And uh, but really, it's an abuse of trust. Um, it's yeah. in my view, it's a, an abuse of their fiduciary duty to patients to to mm-hmm. give them what they. And so we're really against that whole thing. And um, there's many countries around the world, uh, research this globally as well, like uh, c- countries, there's only a handful of countries that do not, do not allow CO, and that's Sweden, Finland, and Ethiopia, believe it or not. But most other, many other places have laws that kind of allow it with, it, with exceptions. Well, okay, you don't have to provide the service, but you have to refer, you have to provide accurate information, you have to provide life-saving care. But the thing with those exceptions and those criteria are that, you know, once you give a doctor this right to practice what I call faith-based medicine, you know, like you, your beliefs are governing what you're doing to patients, well, why mm-hmm. would you suddenly allow that to be taken away and suddenly you have to refer to someone when that makes them feel complicit, right? Yeah. And so in a way, I kind of see their point of view because you're allowing faith-based medicine. You can't just suddenly take it away and, and say, okay, now you have to provide the care because it's, it's an emergency. Well, you know, the conscientious objectors, they won't do that. Like women have died in, in, in countries like uh, Ireland and Italy and in South America because of doctors refusing to provide even life-saving care. And um, so I just think it's wrong. And it's not just doctors, but it's pharmacists, you know, like dispensing uh, drugs, you know, refusing. And um, I, I just think it's, it's a really disrespectful to patients and uh, it mm-hmm. can create burdens. Uh, so for example, um, I mean, I just want to go back and point out that if you look at medical ethics, you know, it's always about putting the patient first and your duty is this and that. But, you know, allowing a CO is almost, it's, it's actually goes against, it goes against all of those ethics. You're not putting the patient first. Suddenly you're first. My own interests are first. And mm-hmm. uh, they talk about, well, it's my freedom of conscience and that's a fundamental right. What about the patient's freedom of conscience? It's yeah. theirs as well. And also you've got a, an imbalance because the doctor is in a position of authority and trust. The patient is uh, vulnerable because they're completely dependent on you for, for that service and may not be able to go to anybody else. So it's extremely yeah. unfair. And people talk about balancing the rights of the patient and doctor. That's you know BS, frankly. And mm-hmm. um, I think it has severe effects because even if there's just something like, like a really minor 
inconvenience, like a little delay. Someone has to go to the next pharmacy. That's still a problem. Why should someone have to waste their time doing that? And there's always, almost always, I think, a, a, this, um, this judgment that comes across too. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't provide that due to my personal beliefs. It's like the patient suddenly feels I'm doing something wrong and they, yeah. they're made to feel you know, less worthy or uh, ashamed or embarrassed or whatever. And why should patients have to suffer through that? Um, also, if you talk about conscientious objection in the military, there's no comparison with a CEO in healthcare because in the military, if you refuse to, you know, go off and fight in the war when you're drafted, you have to take on an alternative service or you may even have to go to jail. But for doctors, there's no punishment at all, at all. nothing. They can mm-hmm. get away scot-free. All the burden falls on the patient. Yeah. And, and Joyce, for- the, the first thing that came to my mind as you were starting to describe this was, again, going ag- against the medical ethics of do no harm. Like that is essentially rule one of doctors and it has been for centuries. And it, this CO just seems like it absolutely contradicts it, mm-hmm. right? Like exactly. you're doing harm to your patients, which is the the one person you're supposed to not harm. So it, exactly. it just blows my mind that they, not that they have this choice. I don't I'm trying to think of how to word this, but that there is this, um, uh, zero repercussion yeah. for doctors to have this uh, conscious bias. Yeah. In fact, it can often benefit them because, you know, they don't have to worry about being stigmatized, you know, or being harassed by anti-choice doctors. They don't have to worry about their professional reputation being, you know, hurt or maybe not being invited to conferences and things like that. So once you allow mm-hmm. conscious objection, suddenly it also expands into a whole bunch. Suddenly everyone starts claiming uh, that they're an objector because just because they don't want to do abortions, right? could be for other reasons. We can see that in Italy, where like in some areas of the country, 80% of odd guys are objectors. It's just crazy. And it's really hard to access abortion. Wow. And, so, um, and uh, this is kind of a, a bit of a different question, but how long does it take a doctor to get trained on how to perform an abortion? Well, um, I, I don't, I'm not a doctor myself, so I'm not sure how long it takes to train on a surgical abortion. It's a fairly simple procedure, so not long. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, people, uh, medical students will go intern at the clinics, you know, here for a few weeks or whatever. Medical abortion with mifepristone, the abortion pill, is much simpler. You can take it's just you're just prescribing a pill, so you can take an yeah. online course for one hour to do that. So it's no big deal at all, and there's really no excuse. And um, I mean, one thing I want to point out, like conscientious objection, I don't even like that term. As I mentioned, it's got nothing to do with military conscientious objection. So I have a new name for it. I mean, it's hard to find a catchy short name, but I call it belief-based care denials. That you know what? That is exactly that. what it is. We're gonna we're gonna start using that. We'll, we'll have to shorten it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that sums it right up. So, what are your recommendations then to reduce and eventually eliminate these belief based denials of abortion care? I think there's a lot that can be done. I mean, we're not talking about you know prohibiting it outright immediately you mm-hmm. know, by law or something. We're not talking about forcing doctors to do abortions. That's often a common objection to our views, right? As if yeah. that you know. That, takes care of the issue. But no, um, I think in a lot of cases, doctors uh, can be taught or they can take like values clarifications workshops. They can spend time uh, with uh, women needing abortion. They can come around and a lot of doctors can realize, oh, yes, I should be doing abortions. And this is something that's an important thing I should be doing for my patients. And oh, I, yeah, I had some misconceptions about this. Now I understand why women need abortions and so on. So you can convince, I think, a, a certain percentage of objectors to come along. So education is a big thing. And then um, going back to like medical school, like especially if you're going into the obgyne specialty, I think there should be mm-hmm. a bit of a litmus test that people have to look at, maybe sign a paper saying you are aware that, you know, as a obgyne, you're going to be possibly required to provide abortions. Uh, so just making them aware of that, maybe sign a sheet. Um, I don't know necessarily, you know, uh, denying them entry into medical school, maybe if they, if they seem really um, stubborn about it or something. But, but, but maybe denying them into that designation, yes, you know, yes, like exactly. yeah. uh, that, that goes hand in hand. It's all together, you know, whether you're caring for a woman who wants to, or a person who wants to carry a pregnancy full term or not, that is the field, right? Like you should yeah, be able exactly. to accept everything that comes with that. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, any job has things in it that you don't like doing. So, you know, even if you believe that abortion is wrong or, you know, it's killing something, well, it's also helping women and saving women's lives. So you can, there's different ways you can look at it, right? Even if your beliefs are a problem. And I think also, uh, okay, so let's say there's now there's a core of objectors that are still there and no, we're not going to do abortions. But why not uh, have some disincentives for them? So right now there's 
absolutely no enforcement or monitoring at all of objectors. Nothing is happening at the level of the College of Physicians and Surgeons. The only recourse that patients have if they're harmed is to file a complaint with their provincial college, but that generally mm -hmm. goes nowhere, or most patients are never even going to complain, right? Because, especially because of the stigmatized nature of abortion. So why not have like a registry of objectors uh, that the college could keep and then some monitoring, like maybe each time the doctor refuses uh, or something, they have to write a report and send it in. Um, and there's checking done and maybe some discipline if, if, if doctors are refusing and harming patients. And how about financial liability, you know, allowing patients to sue if, if yeah. there's harm? Things like that, I think, could go a long ways. Also, if doctors are being um, hired, you know, as a, like an employee of in the doctor or the clinic or whatever, pay them less. <laughs> also, don't let uh, objectors yeah. work alone in a small town, right? You know, so restrict their, their mm -hmm. ability to practice somewhat. Uh, like a pharmacist, for example, well, they shouldn't even be there, but if they are there, they can't never be alone in the pharmacy. They always have to have another pharmacist, pharmacist there who's, who's pro-choice, things like that. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and, and worst case, you know, I think if they really can't do it and they're causing harm to patients like once or twice, then help them, help them move to another discipline or, or a job or whatever. Yeah. Or worst case, they lose their license and they, they go away. So Yeah, there definitely needs to be some accountability there. And that kind of perfectly leads us into our next question. Would you mm -hmm. be able to kind of highlight some reasons why someone who is pregnant might seek abortion care? Sure. I think, uh, I mean, there's lots of reasons. And uh, I think most people will cite more than one when they're asked. First of all, in Canada, people mm -hmm. don't have to state a reason. Um, yeah. But there's the studies done that ask uh, people in surveys, for example. So I think uh, financial problems are a big thing, like knowing that, you know, I don't have the financial resources to have a baby right now. That's a big thing. And especially like I already have a child or two children or three children. I can't take care of another one right now. Uh, you know, I've already had my family. I'm done with my family. I'm 40 now. I can't have another baby. Or on the other end of the spectrum, yeah, I'm 16, I'm 19, I'm a student, I'm in the middle of college. You know, I, no way I can have a baby right now. It would totally upset my, uh, my academic career my and my professional career later. And or having an abusive partner is another big one. Like, I don't want to be tied or even a potentially abusive partner or even just someone, you know, you're not really in love with. Do you want to be tied mm -hmm. to that person for the rest of your life because of this having this child? Right. And um, another reason for having an abortion, which is extremely valid, is I just don't want to have a baby. You know, I'm, yeah. I don't want to have kids. I don't want a kid at all. It's, or, who wants to go through childbirth, all that pain and pregnancy is risky. And, you know, that's a huge thing to go through. And people just take it for granted that women will do this. And it's like. Like, yeah, oh, God, <laughs> I'm childless myself, so I never wanted to have kids. Yeah, can you explain to us what an ectopic pregnancy is? Because I know that that's also another more more of a medical reason why somebody would need abortion care, and we're not super familiar with it. Sure, yeah, there's definitely health reasons to have an abortion as well. So, an ectopic pregnancy, again, I'm not a medical person, but it's when the egg is fertilized. Uh, inside the fallopian tube, it doesn't come down into the uterus, doesn't get implanted properly. And so mm -hmm. it's very dangerous because it'll just, uh, it'll grow and then just the fallopian tube will burst and then mm -hmm. yeah. you know, can affect your future fertility. Also, it's extremely painful, I think. So it's, it's a totally non-viable pregnancy and it's, it's because of the risk uh, to life and health. Yeah. Uh, and abortion is the only um, standard of treatment, really. And, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, many uh, people also have abortions for health reasons. As I said, pregnancy is risky. If you have, a, say, a pre-existing condition, diabetes or whatever, or heart condition, that can be a reason to have an abortion. Uh, or just um, any other health reasons, like sometimes if you contract a disease during your pregnancy or maybe cancer, then abortion might be a good idea as well. So there can be lots of health reasons as well. Yeah, and that's what really blows my mind when, um, especially with a, an ectopic pre pregnancy, it's non-viable. Yet yeah there are physicians and states and people who are refusing to perform abortions at this point. Like, I just, I don't know. I just don't understand because there is never going to be a life from that. That's, it just kind of blows my mind that they will still refuse. Yeah. Well, it's the danger of abortion laws in general. So first of all, we have laws being written by politicians who know nothing about medicine. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. the wording is all vague or confusing or what the hell does this mean? And doctors are, are understandably afraid of being prosecuted. So they, they go the extra yard and say, OK, I'm not doing anything. I, I better not do any of this. You know, I can't take any chances. And so it has a really chilling effect on medicine. So um, so even though like this anti-choice guy in Texas was saying, well, no, no, the law is not, not meant to do that. Of course, doctors can do, you know, 
uh, treat ectopic pregnancies and things like that. But that's not the way the abortion laws work. They have this chilling effect mm -hmm. and there's results in an expansion of uh, denial of care, uh, even from well-meaning physicians that want to help their patients, but they're too scared to. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of, I have, um, I sometimes wish that we'd have more like really brave doctors saying like, F this law, I'm going to just do abortions and come and get me if you want. I've got an army of lawyers and we'll go at it. And yeah, I'd like to see that. <laughs> we need another, another uh, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, we do. Yeah. He's just going to say, I'm coming here. You can come arrest me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do it anyway. Um, so growing up, we, Laura and I, we always knew that we did have access to abortion in our province, but we were never explained to you about how you actually go about obtaining one. It's just abortion is an option, but it's hard to find the steps to determine what you need to do to get there. So could you walk us through how someone would go about accessing abortion care? Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And uh, I mean, just to speak to your point about why it's difficult, it's because it, again, it goes to the stigma, it goes to the past antitrust harassment and even the violence against doctors that we've had in the 1990s in Canada. So, mm -hmm. you know, clinics and doctors might be afraid to say, oh, I provide abortions because they don't want protesters showing up to the door. Therefore, it can be hard yeah. to find services. But what people can do is, uh, and we all we often talk about how access is good in the cities and pretty bad outside cities. Having said that, most uh, Canadians live within a reasonably short distance from a city, if not in the city. So um, mm -hmm. they can basically just call up uh, an abortion clinic themselves and make an appointment. They don't need the referral. Okay. And um, to make it easier to find places, especially if you're not in a big city, there's several uh, resources or lists on the ARCS website. We have a clinic list and mm -hmm. it has the clinic's information and contact information and details of what they do. Also, Action Canada has a similar list and even more expansive list of sexual health centers and NAF Canada as well. So NAF Canada and Action Canada also run helplines. So probably the best okay. place for people to go is call one of those helplines and then you'll get like they can refer you like if you can't get to a clinic and maybe you need a referral to go to a hospital a lot of hospitals do require referrals but some don't okay so you can get a referral from them and they can direct you to here's a hospital in your area this doctor does abortions and they'll help you arrange contact and do it that way so using the health lines is probably the best bet you know unless you live like in vancouver or toronto or montreal where you can just look up a clinic and just call them yourself and mm -hmm. uh, there's option lines as well provincial options lines in bc and nova scotia Okay. And the, the NAF line and the Action Canada line are both national. So that's probably the best way to find services. I would, wouldn't recommend just like Googling on the internet because what you'll find is all these crisis pregnancy centers will pop up and uh, they'll call it yeah. with nice names like first choice pregnancy center and pregnancy care center. And they'll tell, will help you with all your options and, and so on. But be careful that these are anti-choice places are going to try and dissuade you from abortion. So the best way to, to do it is to stick to these uh, two helplines from NAF Canada and uh, Action Canada or look on ARC's uh, clinic list. That's great to, that you provided those uh, resources there. And Rachel and I, were both from rural towns. So like, I'm almost curious now to do like a dry run, you know, like how easy <laughs> is it in our area for, for someone to, uh, one, get an appointment and then two, how far do you have to go? Oh, there's one place that I wanted to mention, uh, I forgot, mm -hmm. it's called Choice Connect. So Choice Connect, all one word, dot CA. It's a website where you just type in where you are, how far along you are, and then it'll pop up with a, a provider near you. Um, oh, fantastic. But, but again, often it says you have to contact Action Canada to get the actual information. But, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's a good place as well. And then, um, yeah, and then once you find a place and call and hopefully get an appointment, in the big cities, you only have a wait maybe a few days or a week, depending on the time of year. Uh, mm -hmm. like the wait might be longer at a hospital, especially regional mm -hmm. hospitals. Um, but you should, in most cases, be able to get in within two or three weeks at the latest. And okay. um, yeah, and I think most clinics do it under like local anesthetic. Uh, some hospitals still use general anesthetic. But again, that's with surgical abortion. Mm -hmm. And now with the abortion pill, things are a bit different. You can actually just, in some cases, have a video call with a doctor, especially if you're in a remote community and then go to your local pharmacy to pick up the pills and then just do it at home. Great. And for the pill, you definitely need like a uh, prescription from a doctor for that. Or is that because I'm, I'm starting to see these websites that people are ordering pills. I think that's more down in the US. So I was kind of curious about that. Yeah. In Canada, you do need a prescription. Um, I mean, 
you can. I mean, there are some reputable websites that uh, you have to be very really careful because especially mm -hmm. now with the opportunity will be way, there's a lot of uh, really, um, you know, fraudulent sites, basically. Yeah. Don't want there any uh, placebo pills. Yeah. Yeah. But there's a, if you check carefully on the web, you can Google. I found a couple of articles recently that actually listed the reputable sites where you can get abortion mm -hmm. pills. And some of them are abroad. Like I'm also on the board of uh, Women Help Women, which is a global group based in uh, Amsterdam that um, ships abortion pills around the world. And um, we're actually registered in Canada, so we don't operate in Canada. But there's another group called Women on Web. Uh, they were the first actually to do this. They started out with that abortion boat, you know, going to mm -hmm. countries with the abortion boat. But now they just uh, send pills around the world to people. And I, I believe they do deliver to Canada. So. Okay, great. We're definitely so if, you know, gonna... if you want to, some people just want to don't want to go to a doctor or have anything to do with the healthcare system. They want the complete privacy yeah. doing it in their own home, and that is safe. You know, if you order from a reputable site, mm -hmm. and they'll give you some uh, medical oversight and guidance and advice. You can even look up uh, their sites that tell you all about it, how to take the pill, what to expect, what possible complications. You know, and um, so you can do it safely as long as you, you know, follow the instructions and, and, uh, and monitor yourself. Good. No, it's so great to know that there are these these options now. And is that kind of the uh, progressive side now of access to abortion in rural areas? Is there anything currently being done about it? Or like it's kind of just getting these more um, online networks together to help improve the access? Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, with the abortion pill, that certainly opens up the door to improving access in rural areas and the North to a great degree. So I'm hopeful that, I mean, that it is happening. But I think it's slower than, you know, what we had hoped, uh, again, abortion stigma and some doctors being unwilling to prescribe. Because even though it's just a prescription, like any other drug, well, I guess it's not like any other drug because the doctor thinks, oh, does this make me an abortion doctor? Oh, am I going to get protesters? And so all these things, you know, that complications come into to play, right? Which is too bad. But, um, but certainly there is a lot of interest in it and uh, more and more doctors are signing up so i think it is very encouraging and it's just going to take more time but i think uh, i'm hoping someday we'll have a, a woman in any community will be able to either find a local doctor or uh, have a video call with a doctor telemedicine and get the pill that way and there should be every community should have at least one pharmacy that carries it in stock all the time so that's the dream and uh, i think we're slowly getting there oh, well that's very encouraging to hear for sure yeah. this is kind of something that the anti-choice groups are doing, they seem to throw out a lot of common health myths along with the abortion pill and uh, just the medical procedure as well. And, you know, what are those common myths that they are spreading? And can you kind of debunk some of those? Sure. Uh, I mean, they've been doing this for ages and it doesn't matter how often you refute these myths, they just keep repeating them. <laughs> That's the nature of an ideology, I guess. But uh, I think one of the biggest ones, especially in more recent times, the one that they keep promoting the most, possibly, at least on their websites, is uh, post-abortion syndrome or post-abortion distress. This is the idea that, oh, if you have an abortion, you're going to feel bad afterwards, you're going to regret it, you're going to feel guilty, you're going to have nightmares, um, you know, you're going to be really weepy on the anniversary of your abortion and all these uh, uh, effects that they warn that women are going to feel, right? And it sort of comes from the, the antitrust mindset that, oh, well, women are supposed to have babies and women are meant to have babies. So if they have abortions, that's, that's bad. That's bad for them. It's going to hurt them, right? So they're convinced that abortion hurts women. So it must do these things to women afterwards, right? And mm -hmm. so, of course, there's no uh, scientific proof for that at all. 99% um, of women do not regret their abortion, even years after their abortion. Um, they know what they're doing. They make a firm decision. Not that abortion is a happy thing. That it could be invoke, invoke sad emotions. But basically, the overwhelming emotion afterwards is relief sometimes even joy and ecstasy. <laughs> but uh, the, the point is, is, it's the unwanted pregnancy that's that's bringing up the bad feelings and the worry and anxiety and fear and all that. Abortion is a solution, brings people's lives back, right? And yeah. so that's a myth. And then another, uh, a lot of uh, physical myths as well. Like for example, that there's this link between abortion and breast cancer or a link between abortion and future miscarriage or infertility. And uh, none of those are true. They don't have any um, evidence for them. There's been many, many studies. I think what the added choice do is they take advantage of bad studies. Like sometimes studies have just a very small sample or they won't have a proper random sample or um, they won't have a good control group and all these things. So it, make it, make it, it can make it appear. I mean, the big thing, for example, is that women who have abortions, um, you can't compare them to women who have wanted babies because there's 
key differences between them. Like women who have abortions often tend to be in a more uh, maybe um, marginalized state, for example, uh, maybe they're more mm -hmm. single or maybe they have health problems or maybe they're in an abusive relationship or maybe they're, you know, they're not ready, you know, they don't have any money. Um, so then it might seem more likely like and a woman has an abortion more likely afterwards to say abuse drugs or whatever. That's that maybe because she was doing that before and that's maybe partly why she had the abortion. So it, it, you, you have to, it's very complicated and you have to tease out these factors and the actual studies are the ones that they support. Uh, are, are confusing correlation with causation, if you, if you know that phrase. And, and just because mm -hmm. um, something might happen with a, a woman after she has an abortion doesn't mean it's related to her abortion. It could be something else uh, from a previous life. And that's usually the case, in fact. Or it's related to the unwanted pregnancy. So all those things like fer fertility, um, future miscarriage, what else? Uh, well, they always cite the risk of death <laughs> uh, with abortion, but it's, yeah. it's so minuscule. I mean, the risk of death from childbirth is 14 times. And the risk of you know, health complications in general from pregnancy is like hundreds of times. Yeah. Um, so mm -hmm. just absolutely no comparison. And, and you know, the earlier in pregnancy you have the abortion, the safer it is, the more risk accrues the later you go uh, for the abortion. But it's an abortion at any point is still safer than childbirth. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I was actually reading some stories of, of women who had uh, taken the abortion pill and they wanted to kind of just describe it to other women who were about to take it or were considering it. And they're just saying, you know, I had cramping. I bled for a few days. It was just like very similar to uh, a period or a, you know, a heavy period. So they really did just kind of soothe the fears of, of women who were uh, considering the pill just because it was an unknown. And, you know, you have these choice groups just making it such a, a big deal and you know oh my gosh like you're gonna hemorrhage or something like that but no like that is yeah. just not the case at all so you know definitely going back to trying to destigmatize abortions I, I know I love that more people are just coming forward and sharing you know no this is exactly what it was like you know I I went through the procedure I was fine you know it, I carried on with my life yeah yeah I mean, you're absolutely right. The anti-choice movement likes to scare people and then, you know, invoke fear and, you know, think about like how they show the uh, graphic images of aborted fetuses on uh, city streets and, and flyers delivered to homes. And, and usually that's sort of like late term fetuses or the, it's really, it's all blown up out of proportion. But, you know, it's, it's an early abortion, especially five, six, seven weeks is, you know, really not much to look at. Uh, I actually watched an abortion mm -hmm. once. I was lucky enough to see one uh, at, um, when Dr. Morgenthaler was alive, I, visited his clinic and uh, he invited me to watch an abortion with the patient's consent. And, uh, you know, it was just, a, it was an amazing experience because um, first of all, the patient was really relaxed and uh, mm -hmm. just chatting to the nurse about, mm -hmm. you know, her work and the TV programs or whatever. And uh, there was no angst or fear or anything. It was just all normal, relaxed moment. And the abortion was like really quick, like less than five minutes. You couldn't see anything. It just like comes out in this uh, plastic tubing. And, and then uh, mm -hmm. it was even invited to, try and look at the, the, uh, the products of conception afterwards. And it's called that because most of it is like the, the uterine lining and, and it's, it's and the only blood that you saw was from the woman. And that, like, mm -hmm. I looked at it and I couldn't see, I couldn't see anything, you know, you need a, a trained eye to even see anything. So it's so tiny. Right. And so the, yeah. it, the, the whole anti-choice rhetoric is so overblown and, um, and they, they think abortion is so awful and they want to scare people, but it's, it's really not. Yeah, I know. And we are very TMI on this, uh, podcast show so like essentially in, in your normal period you know there's there's your uterine lining in there and it sometimes comes out as as chunks and you know from mm -hmm. what you're describing you would see that more than you would actually see any part of a fetus or you know any cells or anything like that so I love that um, you were able to have this experience and now share it with us and um, by chance do you know like how how far along was this this woman I think she was six weeks. Okay. Yeah. And that's, um, that's kind of leading into our, our next little spot here. It's just like the any choice groups though, they're saying like, Oh my gosh, six weeks. That is a fully formed human. Yeah. I mean the whole, you know, all the, the heartbeat laws down in the space yeah. in Texas with six weeks, they're banning six weeks uh, on the basis of there's a heartbeat, but you know, it's actually not a heartbeat at all. There's some, there's some sort of like electrical pulse maybe going yeah. on, mm -hmm. the fetus, but, but the noise, the actual pulse is being picked up. It's, it's being produced by the machine. It's, 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 wow. there's, there's no heart. No heart. Yeah. It's, it's all BS. It's all BS. <laughs> 
So this is a great lead into our next question, which we start a bit broad, then get a bit more specific. So to start off with, what can the average Canadian do to help protect and improve abortion access in our country? But also more specifically, going back to the fear that we were talking about, the that the anti-choice rhetoric wants to put on us, how can we take action against aborted fetus images in public? You know, when they slip the pamphlet in your mailbox or something, because I know Laura has a experience quite recently with this yes. that we were like, it actually happened the day that we put out our first episode in the abortion series that she got this pamphlet and we were like, all right, know. <laughs> the universe. <laughs> yeah. <Funny message. laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, it was just kind of crazy. You know, my partner and I, we were just heading out for a walk and this was our, our place down in the city and shoved rolled up in our door handle was one of these pamphlets and I was just like oh my gosh you know we just put out this episode on abortion and here it is right on my front doorstep a pamphlet that I know is just full of lies but then as we're walking down our street every single house has a Mm. pamphlet on it and you know both of us we were just sneaking up their stairs and pulling them all out and then we we threw them all out because we were just so enraged by (laughs) like this false information and you know the pictures and we we opened one up and I it was just uh, it was ridiculous what they had in there you know for I believe a a 12 week old fetus that they were showing they're like it it looks like a brand new newborn baby Mm -hmm. so it was just ridiculous and I can't imagine you know if if I had a a kid and it was my child who found that pamphlet first you know Mm -hmm. just the the amount of like misinformation and not understanding what that is, it just leads to a whole new generation of like, oh my gosh, this is something we should fear. So is there anything we can do to kind of take action against this? Yeah. And first, I'm really sorry that happened to you. It's, it is really enraging. Um, it was the uh, first time ever in my life that I, I'd come across it. So it was just wild to see the whole street was canvassed. Oh, mm-hmm. it's just awful. Uh, I mean, this is the work of a fanatical group called the Canadian Centre for Bioethical Reform, a uh, very Orwellian okay. name. They've delivered millions of these flyers over the years. I think it started in 2015 during the election when Trudeau was first elected, and uh, they were targeting him. So um, they've been in many, many cities across Canada doing this, I think about 70 or 80. They really like Toronto area, though, as well as you know the bigger cities, Vancouver, um, London, Ontario. Uh, Winnipeg and a few others, Ottawa. So um, yes, what can you do? I mean, it's I know it's very very difficult, and I, I think these these flyers are very harmful to the communities, especially like for young children, but also anyone who might be triggered because they recently had an abortion or a miscarriage yeah. or something like that can be mm-hmm. very very traumatizing and can be really hard on kids too. And it's probably the, one of the number of things, number one things that we get complaints about from the public and how do what can we do about this? So we've had a project for several years now trying to convince cities to prohibit or limit this in some way or other. Uh, yeah. Generally, cities are pretty reluctant uh, because, you know, they don't want to get sued. It's, it's, mm-hmm. uh, it's you know, unfortunately, it's an, also a question. There's there's some freedom of expression, too, going on here. Well, and freedom of speech kind of came yeah. to my mind, essentially. But also, you're trespassing on my property. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, under our charter, rights can be limited. Under Section 1 of our charter, they can be limited to protect other rights. Mm-hmm. So uh, in this case, yeah, they're trespassing, they're, they're invading your private space. And um, also they're, uh, you know, you can argue, you can make a whole gender equality argument that the literature itself is targeting people with a uterus and making mm-hmm. them feel bad. So there's various arguments you can make. It also like uh, cities have objectives, for example, like we, they want a safe, safe and welcoming community and all these things that they, they, they pass bylaws to protect their objectives and, you know, uh, make sure that... Uh, the hut to preserve the welfare of, of uh, citizens, right? So you can argue that this is harming the citizens of the city and it's causing a lot of upset and you know people are calling the police and complaining. So why not pass a bylaw, you know, limiting or prohibiting the signage? So um, mm-hmm. we hadn't had any luck until recently in getting cities to really do this, but we did recently. So well, first of all, p- cities should write their mayor and council mm-hmm. and ask them to pass a bylaw. Mm-hmm. And uh, the model bylaw that they, they can follow, which uh, one has been passed by the city of London, Ontario, which a couple of years ago was just blanketed with these flyers, as well as graphic signage on streets and street corners. The group is still allowed to deliver the flyers, so they still have the freedom of expression, but 
They must enclose the flyers in an opaque envelope or wrapper okay. with their identifying information on the outside of who it's from and what it is so that people can decide whether to open it or not and then hopefully just throw it out, right? So, okay, uh, that's a good point because this was definitely not an envelope. They were just shoved in the in all the door handles. Yeah. So I think it's in a way, I mean, it would have been nice to just prohibit the flyers totally, but that mm-hmm. probably would have invited a legal challenge and then who knows what would have happened. But this mm-hmm. way, they still have their freedom of expression. They can still deliver the flyers, but uh, residents are protected to, to at least yeah. some degree. So, um, and although the, uh, the the CCBR, the anti-choice group, threatened to sue, and I don't think they would have any case. So I think it's a pretty safe bylaw to pass, and cities should take uh, London, Ontario as an example and pass a similar bylaw. Okay, and, uh, great. Well, I'm going to yeah. pass that on to my uh, to my mayor down in the city then. Yeah, great, great. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, I'm going to pass that on to our town too. I don't know if they made it up here yet, but we're going to just get ahead of them though. <laughs> we're going to get ahead of it so that they can't. <laughs> That's great. So what else can we do to help protect abortion access and abortion rights in our country? Right. Yeah. And um, we also have on our page, uh, uh, Take Action Against Aborted Fetus Images, which has a bunch of other things because there's several other cities that have a flyer bylaw as well. Not as strong as London's, but it can be helpful. So, Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, in general, I think uh, we have another Take Action page on our site that lists sort of general things that people can do, easy things. And I think one of the most important things is just like speak up, you know, um, yeah. talk about the issue. Stigma means that abortion, people don't talk about it and it's not out there or people are afraid to talk about it. Uh, you know, one in three Canadians with uteruses will have an abortion at some point in their lives. Uh, tell your story. Uh, I've had yeah. an abortion, I'm not ashamed of it. It's a common thing. At least, you know, tell a close friend or family member and you know, take it from there uh, and just, you um, talk to your friends about it and also learn about it. Like people should know what their rights are, what the law is, what the situation is. You have a little bit of knowledge that gives you the ability to say, you know, leave comments on news sites or blogs or write a letter to the editor, uh, write your MP, for example, you write your MP, that's something you should do anyway, no matter how much you know or don't know, write your MP mm-hmm. and your MLA or MPP, you know, get on their mailing list and make sure that they know your stance. And anytime abortion is in the news, you can maybe fire off another letter to them. What are you going to do to defend abortion rights? I want you to stand up in parliament or, you know, whatever. Make demands that way. But yeah, if you know more about the issue, you can also be in a position to, uh, you know, write other things. You can write your own blog article or other article. You can organize your own event um, yep. if you want, or, or at least participate in other events. Uh, you can join a pro-choice group, become a volunteer. Um, you can make donations, of course. You can sign petitions, like we have a petition on our site right now, a Change.org petition. Uh, you can just search on Change.org, expand abortion rights, and then um, or expand abortion access, I think, and then you'll find it. Mm-hmm. And um, But there's other petitions out there as well. So even just little things like that will help. It's a start. You know, I don't want to like overload people. But mm-hmm. um, just talking about it, I think it's just so, so important. And just um, beating back that stigma, you know, stigma busting, we call it, I think is so important. And being aware yeah. that it is common. I think there's this misconception that only, you know, not many people have abortions or only only teenagers have abortions or only only bad women have abortions. And, you know, it's not the case at all, right? That most people have abortions in fact already have one or two children. Right. And just trying to find the silver lining in what's been going on down in the States. I think it has been this great opportunity where people are actually stepping forward and sharing their stories. You know, I've seen some where mothers are coming forward to their adult children and saying, you know, hey, 20, 30 years ago, I had an abortion. I've never told anyone. So I think it's like great, uh, an equal healing process as it is uh, destigmatizing abortion in general. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I think it's also the way to beat back laws because I, I always look back at the example of Ireland when they uh, repealed their Eighth Amendment uh, a few years Mm -hmm. ago, uh, which basically gave equal legal standing to both, you know, pregnant women and fetuses. And um, they won that amendment like by a two to one margin by, uh, you know, being a very positive campaign, activists, broad based, you know, groups across the country. And uh, but also being um, telling stories, telling women's stories making it personal um, and, um, you know, just all the, all, the, all the really good stuff instead of just, you know, having politicians lead it, for example. So uh, mm-hmm. it needs to be a broad-based grassroots campaign and, um, and also looking at, look at what happened in Kansas when Kansas won uh, mm-hmm. also a two-to-one um, referendum. 
And that's because mm-hmm. uh, they even reached Republicans because it wasn't just about, you know, abortion rights or do you agree with abortion? Maybe they didn't agree with abortion, but they still didn't want the government in their private lives telling them what to do, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, and Republicans are big on that. And similar messages, I think, in Ireland and other places, like um, get government out of our bedrooms, right? Mm-hmm. Going back to the old phrase from Pierre Trudeau. And, and people, that really resonates with people, a wide range of people and not just pro-choice people. So you can even get anti-choice people on side. You know, a lot of anti-choice people, even though they might be politically against abortion and maybe they have a lot of misconceptions, if they're confronted with someone in their own family who needs an abortion, suddenly they yeah. can become quite supportive. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the key is there, like, make it personal. Yeah. Know? Yeah. In, in any way possible. And then that's just how it keeps coming to the forefront and we get change. And of course, you know, vote, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yes. oh, yeah. This is something that uh, majority of our well, it seems like the majority of our country, even though they have a pro-choice stance, they're not out there voting or actively supporting. And that's when our rights get eroded. Because um, even though these uh, anti-choice groups, you know, they're not very large, but they sure are loud. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. we need to be louder as the majority of the country. Especially when we have anti-choice groups specifically trying to elect, you know, anti-choice yes. people to power and and, you know, skewing the, the ratio so that there's, the, the parliament is not even representative of people's beliefs, right? So, yeah, never vote for anti-choice candidates. Exactly. Well, Joyce, that was a fabulous chat, and we're so happy yes. that you were able to join us. Uh, where can our listeners find and follow you? We know the uh, ARC has a fantastic Instagram. That's where we got a lot of our information. Uh, but where else can, can they find you? Well, I was just thinking about that, how to explain it simply and maybe the best way is i don't know if you've ever heard of uh, this uh, app called link tree but it's uh, yeah, okay. tree is a very simple thing and we have a link tree page and it just lists all a web page instagram facebook or petition everything's all, all in one place so just search uh, link tree abortion rights coalition and you'll come okay, up with right. us not to be confused with abortion rights campaign in the uk though <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well we're going to definitely put that down in the show notes so all of our For listeners sure. can find and follow you and help support your great work Super. Well, thanks very much it's been uh, great talking to you and um lots of stuff we went over i think and i hope that uh, people learn something yes well i think you know we definitely learned something here so we definitely think our listeners will too Yes, it was wonderful to have you. And are there any final thoughts that you would like to leave our listeners with today? Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, you know, I think abortion rights, I mean, to me, abortion rights are so fundamental to our rights because we don't have the ability to control your own fertility in your own body. We can't really exercise any other right. It's, It's so fundamental bodily autonomy and to have that taken away from people in the States is just so shocking, profoundly shocking. And um, just r- remember how important it is. And, um, you know, and it's, it affects everyone. It's not just a woman's right. And I mean, transgender people need abortions too, but I don't even mean that. I mean, it's, it affects the whole society. It affects men too. It affects families. It affects the children that are already there. Um, you know, we'll have a better society when people, when people with uteruses are free to make these decisions about themselves. And it's just so, so important. And it's not just like a one issue or just a women's issue. It's, it's, it's bigger than that. And um, it's one of the most fundamental feminist issues, in my opinion. Yep. We are 100% with you there. Again, thank you so much for being here. It was incredible to have this conversation with you and to take in your years and years of knowledge. And, you know, this is just the beginning. There's so many ways that so much more research and so much more discussion that needs to happen about this topic, like you said, to reduce the stigma that surrounds this matter in our society. So shall we close out, Laura? Yes, I think we shall. If you like this episode, please definitely share with all of your friends. We definitely want to spread Joyce's message and all of her uh, hard work to make sure that mm-hmm. we as Canadians can can support her and everyone who is a part of the Abortion Rights Coalition of Canada and all the other networks working hard in Canada. And uh, definitely leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast and Spotify. And Mm -hmm. with that, live like tea. Live like tea. Hello again, PodFam, and welcome back to the After 8 Tea Party. 
we hope you just enjoyed that episode with Joyce. Oh my gosh, she is just Mm -hmm. a wealth of knowledge. She really is. Honestly, like I know she's just like, don't say it this way, but like I was so honored to like just be in her presence and take in yes. all of her experiences and what she knows. Cause like, yeah, just like what a wealth of knowledge. Like I have no other way to explain it. She really just has such an understanding of this issue, but also so much experience with it. She's really been through quite a lot of things when it comes to this. Yeah. And I think it's really important to highlight that, you know, she, she said even herself, oh, I'm just, just a normal person. But mm-hmm. I think that goes to show where, anyone who wants to stand up and get involved can stand up and get involved. Like there is no barrier to entry. You know, these organizations are here. I mean, she started Mm -hmm. them. So that's, that's huge. Which is amazing. Yes. (laughs) But for all of us other average people over here who want to get involved, there is now this infrastructure that exists and it's, Mm -hmm. it's powerful. It's gaining in power. It's uh, doing great work. So Mm -hmm. You know, if if you just listened to this episode and now you're feeling inspired to join one of these groups, you know, definitely reach out. You know, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be a professional. You don't have to be a doctor. You can just Mm -hmm. be someone who cares. Mm -hmm. So, And like she said, there's so many ways that we can get involved with this. You know, we can donate to the organizations. We can sign petitions. We can volunteer for groups if we're able to. And I just, I think that's amazing because if I know for me, this issue has always been very near and dear to my heart. And I know it's been the same for you to know that that's an option for us Mm -hmm. to support this amazing work. It's, it just, it makes it feel like there's a silver lining with all of this. Yeah. Like we can actually take part and be on the right side of history when, you know, accessibility to something that is just a medical treatment Mm -hmm. is around for future generations and even more accessible for them than it is even for us right now and for Mm -hmm. you know our our foremothers and and people who have had to uh really struggle to even get access to an abortion Uh, this is something that you know it could erode away and you know like you said Rachel we here up in the north up in Canada we definitely walk around with rose-colored glasses thinking we're all you know progressive and high and mighty but it can easily happen here and so definitely take the words that that Joyce shared with us today and act on them Mm -hmm. to make sure that um, you know we never have to face this and and our children never have to to face this. Yeah. One aspect of this episode, well, one part of it that really stood out to me was our discussion towards the end about the uh, flyers. I just thought that that's so interesting about the bylaw that's put in place where, you know, they can still put these flyers in your mailbox, but there has to be thing like it has to be in an envelope. It has to reference what it is so that people can have the choice of whether or not to open it. I would love to send in those requests to our own municipal governments because I think we can get away from a lot of the anti-choice rhetoric if we want to, but there's nothing we can do right now in most places against this flyer being put on your doorstep. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as we said in the episode, you know, let's get ahead of it even, you know, that was my first experience dealing Mm -hmm. with uh, an abortion flyer being left on my doorstep and yeah. now I'm, I'm so glad I know what steps I, I should have taken at the time and I am going to take now even though it's been um, a few weeks Yeah, but I want to make sure you know I don't want that to happen yeah. again because honestly like it took my boyfriend and I uh, by surprise like yeah. it's just something that we did not expect to see when we opened our door and mm-hmm. you know in, in my hometown um like you, I've never experienced that before, but uh, now I would like to kind of get ahead of it mm-hmm. and just be prepared. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I, honestly, thinking about it, that point of the episode hit so hard for me, and I'm still not entirely sure I'm going to include this, but London, Ontario, like, I was, I went to school around that area, mm-hmm. so 
I remember I didn't I don't actually recall if I ever got one of these flyers maybe I did and I just kind of ignored it but because we lived in an apartment building it was less likely to happen but I do remember like the picketers in different areas on different like busy street corners I remember there was even some around the school that we there was actually like uh forums uh and groups on Facebook where people were saying don't go uh to this intersection today because this group is there with their signs and it's something that I completely forgot about Mm -hmm. since I've left school but her telling us about what London has done I was like wow like yeah that was actually a really big issue when I was there for school yeah and I've definitely seen um some of those picketing and, and protests, I guess you could call them, uh, in the city. Mm -hmm. And like, to me, that's just disgusting. You know, like I have no words. Sorry. I have, I have nothing else (laughs) to say on that. I was just like, I was just disgusted by it. And I just don't think like, I know there's freedom of speech and all that, but there are so many reasons why someone might need an abortion and I'm sorry but it's no one else's business absolutely no one else's business every reason is a valid reason yeah absolutely and I love that in Canada someone who is getting an abortion does not have to declare why yeah Uh, because I think if they did I I personally believe that that's an evasion of privacy and if they want to share great like I think that's amazing Mm -hmm. and I think um, lots of people should be talking about their experience so we can normalize it because as Joyce said one in three people are going to have an abortion Mm -hmm. in their lifetime that's a lot of people right Mm -hmm. like that's not just this tiny percentage that Mm -hmm. uh, people think who are actually having abortions that's a huge number so you know um, people who we know in our life some of them probably had an abortion and they did not feel safe to talk about it. And that, that also just breaks my heart because it's just a medical procedure, Mm -hmm. right? Like, and I know that there was a lot that went behind that decision that they made and, you know, they're probably very relieved as Joyce says, you know, potentially even uh, happy, but then there's also going to be people who, you know, may have wanted that pregnancy, but for, possibly medical reasons that they were not be able to um, carry it to term. Mm -hmm. But it just breaks my heart that for whatever that reason was, you know, they weren't in a safe place to share that. And that's why I love, um, especially on Reddit right now, there's a lot of uh, abortion groups of women who are sharing their stories of, of going through abortion. And some people will just say like, hey, I just went through it. I'm happy I did, but I really just need some emotional support right now because it was yeah. a huge decision for me. Yeah. And it's so not an easy decision in any way. No, no, it's not. So I love that uh, there's just like a community around that. Mm-hmm. And I think we all just need to kind of get the courage to talk about it because yeah. Rachel, like y- you're probably similar to me where I think we went through different life stages about mm-hmm if we were put in that situation, what our reason was for potentially getting an abortion, you know, Mm -hmm. in school and in high school, you know, too young, right? Like that would have been kind of on top of our mind. And then I know as like, I got out of school, I was like, okay, I'm going to reassess. If I was in this situation, it would be for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. And even now, um, I'm with my partner, you know, like, we have this discussion and it's just like, okay, you know, we're leaning a little bit more towards like, okay, if it happened, like, yeah, maybe we'd go through with it, like a through with Mm -hmm. a pregnancy, but it's still that, you know, hmm, we're not really in a living situation that we would want to have a child. So it's still a part of us where we're just like, yeah, maybe like if I were pregnant right now, I would still go get mm-hmm. an abortion because I don't have um, my, like I don't have my living situation in a way where I would feel good about having a child. Yeah. I'm trying to, I'm trying to explain this all into words. I'm hoping I'm making sense. No, I, I understand completely what you're saying here. And 
I think my reasoning through my various stages of life um, are very similar to yours, but it always has come down to with me is I, um, you know, now I'm kind of, you know, we have our own apartment, like we're both mm-hmm. making deep good money. I'm like, okay, if it happened, maybe I would be leaning a bit more towards having that child. But when I look mm-hmm. back through, you know, even last year, or the year before when I was in school, it always came down to for me the fact that I didn't feel like I could provide that child mm-hmm. with the life that I want to provide my children. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. That's a perfectly that's valid how I felt. Yeah, that's yeah. a perfectly valid reason right there. Like just being like, I'm not ready. Right. Yeah. Like that's a great reason right there. And I think even us who have not gone through an abortion, I think it's important that we are still talking about it mm-hmm. and saying that, you know, hey, if I was faced with a situation, this is where I stand right now because this is my my lot in life and mm-hmm. I don't feel good about bringing a child into my current state. Exactly. Right. And, you know, as Joyce said many times throughout the episode, it's all about reducing the stigma about it. It's all about talking about it. And I really loved the, the section of the episode where she actually walked us through uh, in Canada how we would go about getting access to an abortion because that's something that we should talk about. That's something that we should that should be easily accessible mm-hmm. to find this information because the more the more comfortable we become talking about it, the more comfortable we become talking about the steps or looking into the steps or, you know, contacting the helplines if we need to, if we're in that situation, it gets us closer and closer to reducing the stigma about it because it comes, because it becomes easier to talk about it. You know, like a a, a recent experience I had um, and, you know, I, I find that I'm actually pretty good at talking about this issue, but I had to give myself a reality check because I'm good about talking about this issue with you Mm -hmm. and my partner and my mom and some other close people in my life. But I was talking to my hairdresser last week and she was asking uh, about the show and she was just like, oh, like what episodes do you have coming up? So I was telling her about this one and I was almost whispering Mm. every time I said the word abortion to her because I was just like oh there's other people in here like I like and it you know I didn't care like in my conscious mind I was just like I don't yeah we're doing this episode these are my beliefs but there was something subconscious with that stigma where I was just like oh I have to be quiet about this like we people don't talk about this and recognizing that in myself I'm like all right I've got some further barriers that I need to break down seriously. I'm so glad you said that because I was feeling very much the same. Like I feel like I can talk very candidly on the show here with you, with like um, my parents, my partner and like my close friends. But Mm -hmm. then again, yes, as I'm like trying to talk to people who maybe I'm not so familiar with, I was like a little hesitant and yeah. for me personally, just kind of how, how I am, I just kind of said it anyway, because I was just like, this is very matter of fact, I need to, you know, buck up and talk about it. But yeah. that first couple of times, it was hard because I was like, oh my God, I don't want to offend their beliefs. Yeah, But I'm sorry, if you are against abortion, you're on the wrong side. That's all I can say. I'm sorry, but you're wrong. And uh yeah, like you, it was kind of an internal reflection of just like, oh, wow, I have some barriers that I need to to get over yeah. um, because this is just, I think, should be a conversation as simple as being like, hey, I had my tonsils taken out or I had uh, my appendix burst, so I had a surgery yeah. for it. You know, like that's that is our goal of how normalized we want this conversation to be because mm-hmm. – in terms of medical procedures, it's it's kind of along the same lines, right? Like it's yeah, it's just a, a, a simple procedure, mm-hmm. right? Just like Joyce said. Um, so yeah, I'm glad you kind of felt that hesitation as well. And really, I just kind of had to get over, which I'm still working on, yeah. offending people. 
Yeah, that's right? a good one that you I know? also need to work on because I'm always just like, oh, but like if I say how I am really thinking or how I really feel, like what if it makes someone angry? It's just like, no, what if someone's no, upset? What, what if the feelings are hurt? This is another problem that women have, right? Because exactly. we're always so concerned about hurting other people's feelings. But in this case, I'm sorry, like um, if your feelings are hurt by this, you check your own beliefs. That's that's all I'm going to say about, about that one. <laughs> I was literally just about to say that. It was going to be kind of cheeky where I'd be like, you know what? I'm not actually that concerned if I offend you about this. Yeah. Because I don't really want to be your friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it's kind of funny. I'm going to share a little little thought I had yesterday. I was getting my eyelashes done. And uh, sometimes with, with the technician, we'll, I'll talk about the show a little bit. And I was like debating, I'm like, do I bring up the abortion episodes? Because yeah. she's holding like tweezers <laughs> near my eyeballs. <laughs> I was just like, I was like having that thought in my mind. I'm like, I don't think she's going to blind me. <laughs> I think mm-hmm. we're okay. And, you know, she's a very progressive woman. And, and so it was like, like whatever um mm-hmm. but yeah I did have that thought in my mind of just like is she gonna blind me if I talk about like how pro-choice I am <laughs> oh my god see the one thing that I love is you know my mother knows about this show and listeners she's literally like our biggest fan that woman she will tell everybody about this episode and the series that is coming she apparently has no hesitation and I'm no, like, that's good. We need her. I aspire we need people to be like, like you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, so anyway, Rachel, do you have anything else to to say about that awesome episode of Choice? No, I think uh, I think I have. I'm just a loss for words. Yeah. No, we definitely a covered a lot on this episode. We hope you guys enjoyed it. We actually have a lot more abortion episodes coming up as part Mm -hmm. of this series so definitely watch out for them we're kind of going to be releasing one a month ish i think uh, yeah over the next little bit and we are so excited to be bringing professionals who have the intimate details on what is happening in canada Mm -hmm. i second that second that all right well that is all for us today live like tea Live like tea.